And I'm happy to have Nikki Six with me in the studio today. How Welcome. you doing? Doing well. What's going on? Uh, not too much, man. I, I I don't know where to start here. Okay, we got one of the most storied. We careers. don't want to start at the beginning because it's a long story. <laughs> we're we're going to go back to the beginning, <laughs> right, but we're right. not going to start at the beginning. Um, you know, well, well let's go, just go through a few things here. You started out playing yeah. some hard rock bands in L.A. Sure. You formed Motley Crue. Yeah. Couple I actually of, started in punk rock bands. Punk rock bands. Yeah, way back in the 70s. Which is yeah. where you got your, your bass style. Yeah, from. exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of best-selling memoirs along the way, yeah. and you're and you're making music with yet another band. Yeah, six a.m. Yeah, still in the game. Yeah, a lot of guys stop. Uh, you know, at a certain point, you're yeah. still going. Why? Why do you well, keep going? Well, I, I never understood that because uh, if you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason, and if you're in it for the short game, you're in it for the wrong reason. Um, I got in it when I was a kid. I didn't even know I was in it <laughs> because I was into creativity. And that's why I write books. That's why I do photography. It's why I write songs. It's why I do everything. Um, I, it's about being creative. You have to chase the, uh, the passion. You got to follow your bliss. Mm. And everything else comes. It really does come. And, and a lot of people have a hard time with that. And that means you have to jump off the cliff. You got to take a chance. And uh, yeah, there's rocks below. Yeah, it's scary. But that's the joy. Did you... Is it because you started taking risks when you were younger? Is, do you think that's part of it? I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out why. You, the way you put it is so yeah. simple, right? It is simple. I mean, it could have to do with the fact that um, I was abandoned by my father. So I, I had this, this uh, mistrust. Uh, so I started to believe in myself. And my mom, the same thing happened with my mom. And this is my grandparents. And they loved me very much. They treated me great. They, they, they did everything for me. But they, they weren't my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. They were my grandparents. And I owe everything to them. But at the same time, there was something broken. And I started uh, traveling a lot because we were very poor. We lived in trailers. We went from farm to farm. My grandfather worked in gas stations. Uh, when I lived in uh, Anthony, New Mexico, uh, I had to walk two miles on a dirt road to the bus stop, which was a corner of dirt and dirt. <laughs> I was the only white kid. It was all Latinos. I got bullied. I got picked on. That's where I learned to fight. And through it all, you know, I, I was just like, this, isn't not, this is not everything. Like life cannot only be this at that young age. Mm. And I started writing. I started writing and I started kind of following these ideas. Before about music, you started writing. Yes. Okay. When I, when I got to Seattle uh, early, 15 maybe years old, living with my grandparents in Idaho, um, I had stacks of journals. And she was married to this guy at the time and um, he had a, a – a guitar in the corner okay. that had three strings on it. It was an acoustic guitar. That's it. I loved music. It's like, there, there's a guitar. And I love music. If you love music, that's all you need. I was like, wow, look at that. So I sat down and I started just going ding, ding, ding. I, and I was like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. And I looked down at some of my words and I started reciting them. And I, and I moved my finger and it was at that moment that was all I needed was to move my finger, and it changed the melody, and and that kind of started the whole journey. I, I probably amazing. would have just been an author, or who knows what. But m music is a way to serve up these words and stories, and then of course you get better and better. And you start playing in bands, and you realize what all that's about. So it's it's uh, very exciting. But it started early with me. That's an interesting story because I heard one just yesterday about another songwriter and he had exactly the same story but on the piano as soon as he moved his hands and changed chords he realized this is a song this is a song yeah it's amazing what about the, what about the music you were listening to at that time as a teenager what was that game well you? i mean that was in the uh, in the 70s i was born in 1958 so in you know 1978 i was already in los angeles so we have to go back to about 1972 mm -hmm. and uh 73 74 you know queen bowie rolling stones black sabbath t-rex british uh what they would call glam rock uh big hooks big melodies uh you know exciting looking people you know i used to think to myself where did these people live like what? What? Where is this? Because I want to go there. They did seem otherworldly. Yeah, 
And that and and that was you know I started you start you always emulate your heroes. Yeah, that's a great era for rock music. For it's sure. a great great era, great era. I read that you bought your first bass with money from selling a stolen guitar. Yes, and then that's how you. I was a lovely child. <laughs> and you fell in love with the bass with the punk style. Yeah. How? Who were your sort of uh, um, your idols around playing bass? Well, the way you play. You know, I I um, hung out with these guys. Remember, I kind of started learning how to write songs. And uh, there were, like, these bands in Seattle that I was writing lyrics for their songs. I was like the Bernie Toppin, you know. I was like all these <laughs> punk rock bands. I'm like, here are some words, you know. What's trademarking? I don't know. And um, it was exciting for me. And then started hanging with these guys and started, like, learning to play more. And um, went and used to play this Gold Top Les Paul every day on my bus. I'd take two buses to get to school in Seattle. And um, one of the buses was right in front of a guitar store. So I'd play this Gold Top every day. My dad was like, I got to have that guitar. We were very poor. We lived in kind of what would be equivalent to projects uh, in Seattle. And um, I asked my friend if I could borrow his guitar case, and I just stuck the guitar in the guitar case and closed it up. And I actually asked for an application for work. Guy went and got the application. I ran out the door. You know, never been so scared in all my life. And then, you know, got to hang out with my friends, and they're like, well, we need a bass player. So I got rid of it, and I got a, a BC Rich. Okay. And that was like my first bass. And uh, I always wanted a Gibson Thunderbird. So I figured out how to finagle, how to take the stolen guitar, turn it into a BC Rich, and get myself a Thunderbird. And I started playing little punk rock bands. And uh, I got busted at a Rolling Stones concert because I was an entrepreneur with two ounces of chocolate mescaline. I used to make a nice profit right there. And uh, I had a choice to go to, to, go to Juvie. Till I was uh, of age, or um, my mom just signed for me to, you know, be on my own. Okay. And uh, I had a shattered relationship with my mom. She signed. I took a Greyhound bus to Idaho, worked the fields, um, moving irrigation pipes, saved up more money, uh, had a guitar, a boombox, a couple cassettes, and took off for Los Angeles. And I got off at Hollywood and Vine, believe it or not. It used to be a Greyhound bus station there. Went to live with my uncle, who was the president of Capitol Records. And that was the beginning of me working in record stores, hanging mm -hmm. out with other musicians, and just, you know, interjecting myself into the L.A. scene. It was fashion. It was art. It was music. It was, it was beautiful. The 70s in Los Angeles was an exciting time. Punk rock was kind of coming to a peak a uh, new wave was coming around, which was boring. And, you know, my reaction to that was, you know, doing this other band called London, which was glam punk. Okay. And I wanted more Sabbath. I wanted more pistols. I wanted more, uh, I guess, aggression. I was angry at that point. I felt rejected. I was going through all those things you go through. And my answer was Motley Crue. Motley Crue uh, that you helped found in 1981. Tommy yeah. Lee, Mick Mars, Vince Neil. Yeah. That band really brought heavy, uh, hard rock, heavy metal yeah. to a, a wider audience. There was a lot of uh, opportunity for me in Motley Crue. We had a huge audience. And on the surface, uh, the 80s were about a lot of things that were great about the 80s. The economy was booming. It was, uh, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the best possible way that that could be. And it was a celebration of an era. But, you know, I told you I had a bit of a shattered past. I was a, a dark poet. It was Bukowski for me, you know. Mm -hmm. It was Burroughs. So I would write songs like Wild Side, and everybody would go, yeah, man, we're on the wild side. But if you go underneath... You got Bernie Toppin in there. It's a dark tale of the streets. It says a baby cries, a cop dies, another night on the wild side. East L.A. at midnight, Papa won't be home tonight. He was just found dead with his best friend's wife. So that was always my intent as a lyricist was to take stories and bring them up to the surface where everybody could celebrate them. And it, it takes a special listener to listen deeper and that made that band special. A yeah. lot of things made that band special. Um, but it was always this underlying bit of hope, which is a continuation for me being in 6 a.m. 6 a.m., yeah. I mean, Primal Scream is about my mom and my dad. 
and you know, and how I got through that. And um, I read a book by Arthur Janoff, okay. which was on primal scream therapy. And I actually found it because John Lennon had mentioned it. So I'm like, well, if John Lennon read it, it must be interesting. It was fascinating for me and I ended up writing a song about it. So historically, whether I was in punk bands, uh, glam bands, coming out of the punk movement, starting Motley Crue, there's always been this like rough and tumble honesty mm -hmm. and bam, there it is, rise. You know, there it is, kickstart my heart. You know, you, you, you can get through it all. We're in this together. Marrying those two together, the hope, but also the hard edge yeah. with the, the Which rock. I don't really feel I hear a lot. I, I, I feel hope in some songs, mm -hmm. and then I feel edge and turmoil in others, and I love those too. And I think it's the marrying of those that's a special experience for the listener. What else do you think it was that made Motley Crue so successful? You've talked about each of you bringing something different mm -hmm. musically mm -hmm. to we, the table. We were four individual uh, personalities. Uh, you know, Tommy Lee's a great drummer. Uh, Mix a great guitar player. Vince has the most unique voice. I think my songwriting and lyrics. Uh, it was a perfect time, a perfect storm, and that what made us original is also what made us uh, understand that it was time to disband. Hmm. Uh, we have a, a live uh, concert film coming out. Uh, I think it's called The End at this point, yeah. but you know things change. But I think I, I like that. Um, and Tommy said in there, you know, we're four strong personalities and it's hard to agree on stuff. And um, that happens. Yeah. Like it happens. It's creatively, it's really rich. Like I'm it not also, sad. Yeah. I'm not sad at all. I'm proud. I'm, I'm happy. And I would have been sad if we would have stayed together another 10 years and uh, I would have been in here talking to you and you go, so, you know, tell me how this, you know, going. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm playing the... Uh, the rib joint down the street with just uh, only me in the band, yeah, uh, you know, and it's called Motley Crue Three or something. I, I, I like integrity. You know, I'd rather, I'd really rather go out on my feet than my knees. Well, that being said, how was that last concert, uh, Motley Crue concert? I mean, it was hip. Uh, it was cool. But was it emotional? It was. Hmm. I mean, that's a big night. That's in L.A. It's a big night. It's in L.A. Uh, Vince cried. Um, which I thought was really special because I have seen Vince only cry a few times. That was, that was really nice to see that. Mm. I felt ready. I felt proud. When I was walking to the stage, I was like, we did it. Well, we played at the Starwood January 17th, 1981. Nobody cared. We couldn't get a record deal. And I say we couldn't get arrested. Actually, the only thing we could get was arrested. Our first show ended in a fist fight in the audience. And it wasn't the band fighting each other. It was the band fighting people that, you know, were messing with us. And that was the heart and spirit of that band. And I was able to walk on that stage and go, this is the last night on earth for Motley Crue. And I'm really proud of where we're at. And I wasn't sad. Hmm. I wasn't... Um, I wasn't anything. Did that but surprise it, I wasn't you? in the moment. I was in uh, the moment. Yeah, I got off stage and um, I saw my kids and my wife, and they were uh, at a little dressing room, and I had some catering for friends. And I, you know, walked in, and uh, they're like, you know, how are you? And I was like, oh, I'm great. Let me just get out of my clothes and let's like jump in the bus because I was going to go to Mexico the next morning for a much needed vacation. And I go, are you sad? And I was like, I said, no, I guess I'm not. I'm I'm happy. I'm like I'm happy. It's a good sign. It's an interesting sign. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I'm I'm very mm. compartmentalized as a man. Um anytime in my life I've had a relationship that ends, I I actually when it ends, it, it means it's really over. Um I will take a bullet for you. I will be there for Anything and everything, but when it's over, it's over, and and it's I don't a think good that's thing a bad, a bad I, thing. I don't think that's a bad way to be because you know everybody has their own emotional capacity, yeah. right? And so if you want to be present over here, sometimes yeah. means you can't also be yeah. uh, over there. So, I can't have a wife and a girlfriend. I can't do that. Like I can't have. I could never have two girlfriends. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to be in two bands. So Motley Crue is the mothership. 
Motley Crue got all my love, and 6 a.m. was a project that we did really great stuff to when Motley Crue wasn't working. Yeah. Uh, now, I have 100% of my heart uh, and my time and my energy and my vision in 6 a.m. with James and DJ, and it's very exciting. Um, just back to Motley Crue, just just for one second, because this is an amazing trajectory from fighting with the crowd on that first show yeah. to uh, you know Staples Center yeah. on your final show. But along the way, it wasn't always smooth sailing. No, um, and it's never up. and it's never going to be when you're in a gang. Yeah, it never is going to be when you're you're in a gang. But you know, you've written about all the ups and downs. You yeah. broke up uh, more than once, got back together. Sure. There was everything: illness, yeah. jail time, you name it. Yeah. What kept you guys going during the difficult times? I mean, in my heart, I I believe it was the music. It was the music. It wasn't the money. The band's made enough money over the years to, you know, knock it on the head in 1985. Um, you know, we've sold out arenas and stadiums for decades. So it was never really about that. And you were wise with your money, too. I've been very wise with my money. Um, I learned because I was so poor, um, probably out of fear, to always take 20% of the net, net, net and always put that away and never touch it. So if I made a dollar... Uh, in my case, I'm in the 50% tax bracket. It means I got 30% to live on, to do whatever I want to do. So 20% since the beginning always went into a special place and we worked it. Now, why do I do that? Do I do that to sound like a musician who's bragging about uh, his finances and to make people feel bad? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is um, I'd learned from somebody very smart that if I do that, I can make uh, decisions in my life that are right for my life. And not motivated by money. Right. I say it to musicians all the time. There's a couple young bands coming up that are blowing up. And I said it to them. I could see their you know, eyes roll back in their head. It's really hard. You have to not – you can't look at this dollar and go, I made a buck. You got to look at that dollar and go, I made 30 cents. Hmm. And on that 30 cents, I got to decide where I want to live, what my lifestyle is. And are you going to make another 30 cents, uh, you know, the next year and the next year and the next year? And then how do you spread that out to live? I've never had to make a decision in my life based – since I was a kid, when I had nothing, I had nothing to lose. But now as a father, as a husband – as you know, someone who does radio, photography, I have a new band. Um, I don't have to do anything based on anything other than strict passion. And when I wrote mm -hmm. The Heroin Diaries, people said, queer suicide. When I showed people the photography from This Is Gonna Hurt, I had people kind of pull back from the photography and go, this is like, people aren't gonna get that. But when I did book signings, 5,000 kids not adults, but kids lined up with the book that would cry and say, I feel like I have strength from this book because I'm not the only one that has a weight issue. Yeah. I have an overbite. I'm not the prettiest kid in, in school based on uh, what other people say. And you, so, could, and you could go there because you can make creative decisions and didn't yeah. have to make and And guess what? What if I did it and, and blew it? Yeah. What if I came on and I talked to you and you said, hey, that 6 a.m. thing you did, dude, that sure tanked. I'd say, well, you know, we got another one in us. We got another bullet in the chamber. Well, how can you do that? Passion. Hmm. Um, I, I feel like I, I have to say this. I feel like that might be interesting for people to hear coming from you, yeah. that the kind of financial uh, shrewdness right, right. there <laughs> for people that are kind of familiar with your old lifestyle, sure. they might be surprised to hear that. I think they would be surprised to yeah. hear that. And um, I, I will say it again, that if you are doing anything in your life, please invest in yourself. Uh, if you're a man and you're the head of a household and you are getting married and you want to have a, a child and you're 30 
you're going to live to be 80. You got 50 years in front of you, but more importantly, your child's got like longer and their children have longer. So, you know, make, make wise decisions. If, if people in our economy made wiser decisions, we put less strain on our society, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone doesn't get that opportunity. Listen, when we were coming, I was on food stamps with my mom, right? I ended up sleeping in parks because I was probably crazy. I said, I got an idea and I'm going to go for it. I couldn't get much lower than where I was, so I had nowhere to go but up. It's, it's, it's the drive and the passion, but at some point if you get an opportunity, try to, try to think about the future. You've been forthcoming about so much of your life, and one thing that you've written about uh, is surviving two serious heroin overdoses. Um, I want to ask you uh, if you feel like there's something about you that allowed you to survive that, or if you were just one of the lucky ones, what do you think? <clears throat> well, I mean, when you're an addict, you have more than just a couple, you know, bad experiences. Um, that lifestyle, the people in that lifestyle are, let's say, don't have your best interest at heart. I um, experienced multiple uh, seizures from cocaine, uh, smoking cocaine, shooting cocaine, um, heroin overdoses, you know, all kinds of crazy experiences, guns being held in my head. I remember I'm one of the biggest bands in the world at this time. Hello. Wow. But addiction's a bitch. Demons, man, they are just waiting to get you. And, you know, mine got out of the box and I lost control. And ego's part of that, you know. So, you know, for me, my final overdose it ended me up um, dead for two minutes. And um, thank God, even though I don't think it was God, it was a paramedic <laughs> for the... Uh, adrenaline shots into my chest. I, I, I came back from that. Um, my doctors say when they do my blood work and check my livers, they're like, you're like a 26 year old. And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> Why do you I don't need Cialis. I'm solid, <laughs> but the, I don't know. And I take care of myself and I eat good and I try to take care of my body. Um, and I don't know. I don't know, huh. but I feel that I let go the last time that I ever shot heroin overdose. I feel like I let go. I just said, I'm not going to fight anymore. And it's something about in life when you let go of the rope. Like it's the other guy falls on his ass. You spend so much time in this tug of war. And I just said, okay, you guys win. And all the demons fell on their ass. Wow. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine that. Like, what do you mean by let go? Like you. I just, I was like, you know, I can't fix my relationship with my father. He's dead. I can't fix my relationship with my mom. Those were her decisions. Um, I had to put the baggage down. You know, it's like mm -hmm. imagine a, a guy carrying around like you know, 18 suitcases strapped to his back. I'm like a donkey, like on the middle of the freeway, pulling all this stuff, and everyone's like, "Dude." Let go of the baggage. Was it people telling you that you need to do this, or did it just click in your head like, I can't do this anymore? Well, people were telling me before, but of course I was smarter than them. Uh, it's only through that moment of clarity, whatever it was, that I said, I give up. How has that shaped your view now? Uh, I have a st stubborn streak, and sometimes I get on it, and I, I lose my patience, and I, I start to uh, become what I call a tank. Uh, you have two options. You can be a tank. You can be a foot soldier. You can be a helicopter. Uh, a helicopter has great opportunity to have strategy, and strategy in life is important, whether it's uh, making music or having relationships, and you can look up and go, okay, let me, let me survey the next few months and how I'm gonna do it and how much time am I putting into my relationship, and then, hey, I need to put time into something I'm passionate about, and it, it goes on and on and on, but sometimes I find myself down in the weeds and I get frustrated, you know, and, and my wife says, if you bring up that tank and helicopter one more time, I'm going to slap I think those, it's a good metaphor. I'm going to slap those words out of your mouth. That's a good metaphor, I think. I go, that's abuse. 
uh, I want to ask you uh, now about this this new project again, just to, to bookend this thing. Um, what's special about this mix of guys, 6 a.m., creatively, musically? It is, as much as it sounds like a bumper sticker, we're best friends. Uh, I never had that before. You know, I was in a band. I was in a gang. These guys are so talented and we're so close and yes is always the answer. So if I'm working with you and you're DJ Ashman, my guitar player, and I say, uh, hey, DJ, I got the – he says yes. I'm like, well, you don't even know what I'm going to say. He goes, I don't care what it is. It's yes. And that's how we work. We work in a circle. Every idea is a good idea. And we flush them out. And then people start doing layers and jamming and creating. And it's like a think tank. And then some guy plays something on guitar and a piano comes out and all this stuff. And I'll be honest with you. If you take your ego out of the creative process, the creative process will reveal itself. And it will say, this is not good. You don't have to tell anybody. Everybody will go, hmm, this one's not really, it's not really sparking, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the ego, you know, I always say your ego is not your amigo. And I had this song called Madrid in Flames. It's been around for a long time. It's a very cool thing. Uh, I think I actually wrote it in Madrid you know, looking out of a hotel, and I think there was some flames. It's simple as that, right? Okay. Been floating around for years, and we we're writing this this double album, and um, so I got this idea and start playing it for the guys and DJ. Oh, that's really cool. He starts playing, starts sound like kind of like uh, metallic, a black album. I go, wow, that's really cool. And so we kind of mapped it out. James and DJ uh, went up to hit DJ's house to cut some guitars, and then we're gonna flush the idea out. Mm-hmm. James came back down. I said, oh, man, I can't wait to hear uh, Madrid and Flames. He goes, well, you know, it kind of stunk the place up. And I go, oh. He goes, yeah, it, it didn't. Uh, it just didn't flush out. And so I could have said, I don't understand why my idea is not working. Or I could have said, okay, well, I trust you guys, my partner. James was playing the chords still on guitar while we were doing something. And he started singing this melody line, and this song ended up going from that to having a few different chords and being the the like the the beginning of a song that ended up sounding kind of like Blackbird by the Beatles. Huh. And it's on the second record. Who knew? If you just let go, it will reveal itself. And that's easier to do with friends. Of yeah, course. it's really easy to do with friends. So I can depend upon them, they can depend upon me. Uh, a lot of our songs are conversations, uh, might be a frustration, observation. Um, Lies the Beautiful People, which is a number one hit for us, started with uh, DJ had a riff, and James had this idea for a melody, and I was on my way to the studio, and I grabbed something out of the grocery store, and People Magazine was there, and I saw it. It said, 100 Most Beautiful People. I said, okay, well, that pisses me off. So I grabbed it, went to the studio, and I put it on the table. And I kind of slapped it on the table, you know? And they looked at me like, what's up with you? And I go, does that piss you off? And the DJ goes, who are they to say who's beautiful? And I go, it's like the lies of the beautiful people. And that song was born, and people still to this day come up to me and go, you know, it makes me feel really good that I'm not part of that list. Now, I have to say, there's nothing wrong with that list. George Clooney's a good-looking man. He's Absolutely. a sophisticated man. He's smart. He's a talented man. But it's okay to not just look like George. I don't look like George. So it's got to be like... The like People magazines, like one billion most beautiful people, and like you can be black and Asian and tattooed and bald and fat, and like that's my idea of beauty. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, finally, before we wrap up, I've kept you way too long. Um, you're one of the lead songwriters in this project, as you were with Motley Crue. What's inspiring your songwriting? Uh, well, at this, this point? band, it's interesting. Um, I'm not, I'm, a, it's everything's a third. Well, the way it works is me, James, and DJ write the music, and then me and James write the lyrics. It's exciting for me to have a partner, James, a very talented lyricist, but I've been uh, handling the lyric writing for over 30 years alone in, um, in Motley Crue, so it's exciting. That's kind of how it works. And DJ's guitar might influence a melody line, which might, spark me to say a word that then James writes a lyric for 
And then I flesh out a bridge, and it's just it's so nobody always, has like separate responsibilities. Yeah, it's all very it's just, fluid. And well, it was sometimes James James is the producer, um, and James will say, "Okay, I need you to do this," or "DJ, I need you to do this." And um, sometimes I'll say, "Hey, can you throw a quick rough vocal down on that, so maybe I can spark an idea for a lyric?" So it's it's always like jamming, and because we trust each other, no one's like ego gets involved. It's yeah. pretty magical. I gotta tell you, uh, six AM music is exciting to make and exciting to play, mm. and uh, making a double album was a, a challenge of a lifetime. Before I let you go, we've been going through your whole life and your whole story. Uh, you gave some financial advice. What's another piece of advice you would give, most important piece of advice you would give to somebody starting out in music right now? In music? In music. Well, I would say if you want to be in a band, you want to be in an original band, right? Because that's really the only way to, to get into the game. You need to write original music. And what do I mean by that? I mean original not looking at the format and going, well, this is what's happening right now because by the time you get there, they already changed their they already changed their game plan. Mm -hmm. Follow and and find and listen and copy. Very important. Copy great songwriters. Now you're gonna tell yourself who's a great songwriter. I think Freddie Mercury's a great songwriter. I think um, you know Ian Hunter from Out the Hoople, great lyricist. I could do my list, mm -hmm. and then I sit there on Cheap Trick, for example. Like, I love Cheap Trick. I need to kind of write something like this, and I love Ian Hunter. I ended up writing this song called On With The Show. Uh, at the time, I you know, was really struggling with this identity of being born with the name Frank, and my dad's name was Frank, and he abandoned me, so I changed my name. So the opening line says, Frankie died just the other night. Some say it was suicide. So what I did was I copied my heroes, I made it original, and then I in, injected something personal into it. And I always say to young songwriters, and I've, I've had them you know, say, ah, I don't wanna do that. Put your life in the song and other people will relate. Put your life, put your experiences, put your heartbreak, your love, your passion in the song. And, you know, Harry Nielsen was a friend of mine, and he had this song, um, it was called Me and My Arrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I said to, to Harry, I said, hey, man, I love that song. What's that about? He goes, I, I had a dog named Arrow. So I, he was so passionate about it that it became this huge thing for him. And I'm just saying, if you're a songwriter. Put yourself on the line. Put yourself on the line. Thank you, Nikki. Cool, man.